Hello. In this session, we're going to discuss the communication options available in BADA. We will discuss the network, telephony, and messaging items in detail. I'll be covering supported intercommunication technologies, such as HTTP, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, DNS, sockets, near-field communication, telephony, and messaging. These are explained in detail in the upcoming slides. This video lecture explains various features, such as network accounts and connection management. The messaging namespace includes SMS, MMS, push messaging, and email. Telephony mainly covers the call, network, and SIM features. There are many other namespaces, too, which have been explained in this video lecture, such as sockets, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, HTTP, and NFC. The HTTP client architecture provides a generalized mechanism for HTTP-like protocols that operate over various transport layer protocols. Using this namespace, a client can choose an HTTP protocol, encode the data, then transport it. The default operation provides plain text HTTP that operates over a TCP IP connection. Plain text HTTP is explained in RFC 2616. Using the HTTP namespace, a client can choose an HTTP protocol, encode the data, then transport it. Key features used in HTTP protocol implementations are multi-sessions and multi-transactions. This protocol implementation mostly includes the HTTP 1.1 client feature, such as connection management, pipelining, and chunking. The HTTP namespace handles cookies received by the server as part of any particular HTTP instance. The authentication class handles the client's HTTP authentication activity over the duration of a single transaction. There are various other features, such as HTTP redirection, multipart, and URL encoder decoder support that are included in this namespace. The HTTP privilege is needed in order to use the HTTP APIs. A session encapsulates the client's HTTP activity over the duration of the client's execution. This is a set of transactions that use the same connection settings, such as a proxy. The client may use several sessions concurrently if desired. A transaction represents an interaction between the HTTP client and the HTTP origin server. Normally, a transaction consists of a single exchange of messages between the client and the server. A client requests, and the server responds. A transaction encapsulates a request and a response. The HTTP request class represents an HTTP request message which stores a method. For example, HTTP GET and a URI, as well as the other message headers and the body supplied by the HTTP message base class. The HTTP response class represents a response message which stores a status code, status text, and the server version information, as well as the message headers and the body supplied by the HTTP message base class. This diagram explains the basics of the HTTP protocol. The HTTP session is comprised of HTTP transactions. An HTTP transaction is comprised of requests and responses. Let's look at the steps that need to be followed for the HTTP session creation and establishment. 
This includes the construction of the HTTP session with the target host address and opening a transaction of the session. Add a transaction listener and get a request from the transaction and set it up. The IHTTP Transaction Event Listener interface provides listeners for HTTP transaction events. The on transaction ready to read listener listens to the read body event and notifies when the content of the body has been received. The subsequent slides explain the HTTP session creation or establishment and listener functionality with the help of examples. This code explains the HTTP session creation, the opening of the transaction, and adding the transaction listener. First, I created an object for the HTTP session class. Then, I constructed the HTTP session class object with the required arguments, i.e., the HTTP session mode, proxy address, host address, and a null argument for common HTTP headers. Then, I created a transaction of the session, after which I added a transaction listener to the transaction object. Now, let's look at how to send an HTTP request. First, I've taken the pointer of the HTTP request so that we can use various methods of this object. Then, I've set the URI to http colon forward slash forward slash www.bada.com. I then took the header and added the required info to it. The add field method adds a named field which is a field name, field value pair, to the current instance of the HTTP header. Once the header addition is complete, I submitted the request to the server by calling the submit method. In this sample, we'll see that the implementation details for the on transaction ready to read listener. This listener is called when the content body of the HTTP response has been received. Check the status code of the HTTP response. If it's OK, it means that the HTTP response has been received correctly. Then, get the header by using the API getHeader method and read the body of the information received by using the readBodyN API. Here, I'm going to explain the HTTP multi-part upload implementation. First, I've created and initialized the object of the P multi-part entity item. Then, I've added various used formats, such as strings and files in the multi-part. After that, I've set the multi-part entity to the HTTP request, and then submitted the request with the submit method. Let's discuss the DNS class now. This class represents a request for information from a DNS server. The domain name system makes it possible to assign domain names to groups of internet resources and users in a meaningful way independent of each entity's physical location. This class supports the DNS lookup function and requires the NET privilege. A DNS request can be one of two types, represented by get host by address and get host by name. The get host by address method represents a request for the DNS lookup of a host by providing its IP address as the argument. The getHostByName method represents a request for the DNS lookup of a host by providing its name as an argument, for example, www.bada.com. 
both requests can be made in asynchronous mode. The iDNS Event Listener Interface implements listeners for DNS events. On DNS Resolution Completed N is used to notify the result of DNS request. In this API, it's recommended to always check the error code before accessing the result. If the result is not success, then the IP host entry item may not exist. This slide explains the pseudocode implementation for the DNS class. The initialization of the object was done in the foo function. Sending a request to get the host by name is implemented in this slide. First, construct and initialize an object of the DNS class. Then, using get host by name, request a DNS lookup using the host name. This method is asynchronous. On DNS resolution completed N is used to notify the result of the DNS request. A socket is a communication mechanism which was first introduced in the 4.2 BSD Unix systems in 1983. A socket is a one endpoint of a two-way communication link between two programs running on the network. The socket's namespace is a part of the net namespace, which implements socket data communication protocols. It provides a rich set of methods for connecting, sending, and receiving data over a network. The socket class provides methods for standard BSD style socket calls. For example, using the TCP socket, clients connect to a server and the server listens for new connections from the clients. Once a connection is established, data can be sent or received. There are two communication mechanisms used here, synchronous and asynchronous. Synchronous communication is also known as blocking mode. As we know, to achieve synchronization, an application may be paused. Asynchronous communication is known as non-blocking mode. An app using the socket implementation should use the socket privilege. The various methods given in this class are the connection establishment, synchronous transfer, asynchronous transfer, and connectionless transfer methods. The connect method establishes a connection to a remote host for a connection-oriented socket. This socket is of the net underscore socket underscore type underscore stream type. The accept n method accepts an incoming connection. It extracts the first connection from the queue of pending connections and creates a new socket with the same socket type, protocol type, and protocol family as the listening socket. The iSocket event listener interface specifies the methods used for notifying different kinds of socket events. These events are only sent out while using the socket in non-blocking mode. A listener is registered by calling the add socket listener method. One of these methods is called when a socket event is generated. In this slide, I'm going to explain the method to work on the socket client. First, we have to construct a socket client and put it in blocking mode. Then, we need to connect to the remote host. The socket connect method establishes a connection to a remote host for a connection-oriented socket. The socket send and socket receive methods are used for sending data to a socket of the net underscore socket underscore type underscore stream type 
and receives data from a socket of the net underscore socket underscore type underscore stream type. Once sending and reception has been completed, we can close the socket by using the socket close API. Here's an example which explains creating a socket and setting the connection. This code explains initializing a socket with non-blocking mode. Then it connects to the host address 202.30.31.60. The Connect API is used for connecting to the other endpoint. This slide explains sending the data to a peer. The Send API is used to send the data for a newly created socket. It sends data to a socket of the net underscore socket underscore type underscore stream type. The point to be noted here is that the send method sends data to the remote host specified in the connector accept method. The send method sends data in the buffer until length, starting from the current position of the buffer. The send method can only be used for connection-oriented sockets. In blocking mode, if there's no space left in the send queue, the socket is blocked until space becomes available. This slide explains the reception of data. First, we allocate space in an array with a 1 kilobyte size. The receive method copies data into the buffer parameter, starting from the current position of the buffer. After the operation, the position of the buffer is incremented by the number of bytes successfully received. The new position cannot be larger than the original limit. You can only call the receive method from connection-oriented sockets. If no data is available at the socket and the socket is in blocking mode, this method stays blocked until data arrives. After the completion of the job, the socket should be closed and the memory should be released. Now, I'm going to explain the pros and cons of the blocking mode transfer of data. Blocking mode is easy to develop and to understand. There's no complicated communication synchronization. But it can freeze the application when no response is received from the host. A delay in transmission creates the picture of a frozen application. Similarly, there are pros and cons for non-blocking mode too. In non-blocking mode, receive and send are detected immediately. The first step to implement a non-blocking mode transfer is to create a socket in non-blocking mode. After adding a listener, sending and receiving data occurs asynchronously. Here we are coding for the sending and receiving of data in non-blocking mode. Create a connection-oriented socket. Create an Call the socket connect method. On receiving a connection response, the listener function is invoked. Here we have implemented the listener functionality. We've created a class in which the required data is maintained for the implementation of the listener. Variables such as the total length to send and receive have been declared. On socket connected notifies a connecting socket that its connection attempt has been completed successfully. Once the socket is successfully connected, we can start sending data. Here, I'm going to explain the on socket ready to send event implementation. On socket ready to send notifies a socket that the data can be sent. We need to check whether the socket is in sending mode before sending something over the socket. We can only send data if it's in sending mode. In this sample, if all the data has not yet been sent, 
I have set the status to 1 so that data sending will be repeated. In this slide, I implemented the Ready to Receive functionality. The OnSocket Ready to Receive event notifies a socket that the data is ready to be retrieved. Here, I'm first checking whether the socket is in receiving mode. If yes, I start receiving the data. If not all the data has been received, I'm returning the control to receive more data. When all the data has been received, we'll close the socket. The onSocket closed method notifies the registered socket that the peer socket has been closed due to a normal or forced termination of the network. It is also used to notify a connecting socket that its connection attempt has resulted in an error. The Secure Socket class provides the SSL supported socket with security features. It's very similar to a normal socket, except that it only supports non-blocking mode. It's used for connection-oriented sockets only. It bypasses listening and accepting and supports client mode only. Wi-Fi is a wireless local area network that links two or more computers or devices based on the IEEE 802.11 specification and that enables communicating between devices in a limited area. Wi-Fi Direct is a technology to communicate between Wi-Fi devices without wireless access points or base stations in infrastructure mode. It provides a rich set of methods to manage Wi-Fi devices and accounts and to communicate over a Wi-Fi channel. Wi-Fi is a type of local area network that uses high-frequency radio waves instead of wires to communicate between devices. It provides a rich set of methods for managing Wi-Fi devices and accounts as well as communicating over a Wi-Fi channel. Wi-Fi operates in two modes as previously explained, i.e. infrastructure mode and ad hoc mode. The image shows an example of infrastructure mode, where mobile phones that have Wi-Fi capability are connected to each other using a Wi-Fi access point. A Wi-Fi client must use the same SSID as the AP of the WLAN to join the network. The image shows an example of ad hoc mode where Wi-Fi enabled mobile devices and laptops are connected without the use of an access point. In this mode, the devices can directly communicate with each other. In ad hoc mode, all Wi-Fi peers need to use the same SSID and channel number. For working on Wi-Fi applications, we have to set the privilege to Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi Manager class provides the functionality for creating an instance of the Wi-Fi Manager and managing local Wi-Fi devices. It also allows the listener to get events from local Wi-Fi devices. Here, I've created an instance of the Wi-Fi Manager and listener for the same. The Wi-Fi Manager is initialized and activated using the Construct and Activate methods. The current status of the connection to a specific access point is verified using the isConnected method. The deactivate method is used to deactivate the local Wi-Fi device. This slide here explains the simple ad hoc network service. Ad hoc listener is used to create a listener object and then the ad hoc service method is used to create a service. Get neighbors n gets the information of neighboring peers. If it's valid for all neighboring peers, then get the names and addresses of all peers. Send broadcast message is used to send a broadcast message to all the peers on the ad hoc network. To stop an ad hoc service, the stop ad hoc service method is invoked. Furthermore, in this slide, there are various listener methods for ad hoc networks. On ad hoc service started 
is the event handler used to notify that the ad hoc service has started. On ad hoc service stopped is received once the stop ad hoc service method is executed. Similarly, on message received is used to notify when a message is received by the device. I'm going to explain Wi-Fi Direct very clearly in this slide. Wi-Fi Direct, formerly known as Wi-Fi Peer-to-Peer, is a set of software protocols that allow Wi-Fi devices to talk to each other without the need for wireless access points or hotspots. Using Wi-Fi Direct, it's easy to share, show, print, and synchronize content. As we know, Wi-Fi was developed and is supported by the Wi-Fi Alliance, who developed the Wi-Fi certified standards. Ad hoc is a normal Wi-Fi service, which involves an AP, whereas Wi-Fi Direct doesn't involve physical access points. Wi-Fi Direct functionalities are provided to manage Wi-Fi Direct devices and groups. The Wi-Fi Direct Device Manager class provides methods to create the Wi-Fi Direct Device instance and to manage Wi-Fi Direct functionalities. Here are some of the methods provided by this class. To activate and deactivate a Wi-Fi Direct Device, we can use the Activate and Deactivate methods. Creating a Wi-Fi group is achieved through the Create Group API. To scan for Wi-Fi Direct devices, the Scan API is used. To associate to a Wi-Fi Direct group owner, we need to invoke the Associate API. The Wi-Fi Direct device and Wi-Fi Direct group listeners have various associated methods to notify of various events. On Wi-Fi Direct Association Completed, notifies of the completion of the association of a device with a group owner. The activation and deactivation of devices is notified by the on Wi-Fi direct device activated and on Wi-Fi direct device deactivated methods respectively. When a group is created, the event is notified by the on Wi-Fi direct group created n method. On Wi-Fi direct scan completed n notifies the completion of the Wi-Fi direct scan. The group owner is notified of the client association and disassociation via the on Wi-Fi direct client associated and on Wi-Fi direct client disassociated methods. On Wi-Fi Direct Group Destroyed is invoked when the Wi-Fi Direct Group is destroyed. The starting and stopping of the Group Member Info Service is notified via On Wi-Fi Direct Group Member Info Service Started and On Wi-Fi Direct Group Member Info Service Stopped method. The On Wi-Fi Direct all group member info received n method is invoked on the iWiFi direct group client listener listener to notify that the Wi Fi direct client has received all the group member information. Similarly, the on Wi Fi direct group owner info received method notifies that the information about the group owner has been received by the Wi-Fi direct client. The termination of the association of a client with the group owner is notified by the on Wi-Fi direct association terminated method. The Bluetooth namespace provides a mechanism for peer-to-peer -peer communication. Bluetooth is a sub namespace of the net namespace. It implements the Bluetooth data communication protocol. It provides a rich set of methods for connecting, sending, and receiving data over a Bluetooth connection. This namespace implements the Bluetooth data communication protocol. 
It provides a rich set of methods for connecting, sending, and receiving data over a Bluetooth connection. The Bluetooth namespace consists of submodules to support different profiles, such as GAP, OPP, and SPP. The General Access Profile provides a base for other profiles, and it helps two Bluetooth devices to discover and connect to each other. The Object Push Profile is used to send objects such as pictures and audio files. This is called push, as it's instigated by the sender rather than the receiver. The serial port profile emulates a serial cable to provide a simple substitute for the existing RS-232 connection. To use a profile specific to Bluetooth, we have to set the privilege Bluetooth in the manifest file. This example explains the SPP initiator. The Bluetooth manager and initiator object creation has been implemented in this code segment. The Bluetooth manager is responsible for the activation of the Bluetooth services, which are activated by calling the btManager.activate method. Once Bluetooth is activated, we have to get info for the paired device list as shown in the code using the get paired device list n method. Once we have the paired device list, we have to connect it to the remote SPP device as shown in the code using the connect method. This slide explains the declaration of the Bluetooth SPP listener. We've declared virtual functions, which are to be overridden in this class. The onSPPConnectionResponded method notifies when an SPP acceptor responds to the connection request. The onSPPDataReceived method notifies when the data has been received. And onSPPDisconnected notifies when the connection is disconnected. Near Field Communication, NFC, allows simplified transactions, data exchange, and connections with a touch. It enables devices to share information within a distance of less than 4 centimeters with a maximum communication speed of 424 kilobytes per second. NFC-enabled devices use the 13.56 megahertz radio frequency while communicating. The Near Field Communication Service is a set of short-range wireless technology services. It also includes contactless card technology, the vicinity card known as RFID technology, and Near Field Communication technology. In BADA, NFC read-write mode is supported and in read-write mode, the device is capable of reading and writing NFC forum-mandated tags, such as in the scenario for reading an NFC smart poster tag. The read-write mode on the RF interface is compliant with the ISO 14443, ISO 15693, and Filica schemes. Using an event injector in the emulator, we can simulate the NFC modes. In this slide, we're creating the NFC Manager instance and registering various event listeners of the NFC Manager. Is Tag Connected is used to find the tag connection status. The Get Current Tag Connection N method is then used to get the tag connection with the currently detected tag. Add Tag Discovery Event Listener is registered with the NFC Manager instance to be notified when the tag is discovered. Add N Def Message Discovery Event Listener is registered to be notified when the N Def message is discovered. On NFC Tag Detected N is invoked when a tag is detected in the vicinity. The on NFC tag lost method notifies of a lost tag connection. 
When an NDEF message is detected, the event is notified by the on NDEF message detected N method. Messaging is one of the domain namespaces of BADA. Its main purpose is to access the messaging capabilities of the device. It consists of many methods that perform different tasks, such as sending SMS, MMS, email messages, receiving SMS messages, retrieving SMS messages from the specified message box, and receiving push messages. Let's look at the messaging class. The main feature includes sending and receiving SMS, MMS, email. Searching for SMS messages in the inbox, outbox, sent box is also described in this slide. This supports the reception of push messaging. In order to use the push messaging service, the component setup should be executed. We're going to explain the sending of a message programmatically. Steps will be mentioned clearly, such as implementing an SMS listener and a message event listener. Create an instance for the listener. We need the SMS Manager instance to manage SMSs. Set the message body text, then create a recipient list and add recipients. Send the message with recipients. Here we are going to explain the coding part as we explained in the previous slide. This line explains creating an object of the listener instance. Here we're calling the constructor of the SMS manager instance with the listener as the input to check the status of the message being sent or received. Here we're constructing a message instance with body text and populating the message recipients. Once the message body is ready, we can send the message using the send method. This slide explains the SMS listener class declaration. We've added two methods, on SMS message received and on SMS message sent in this class declaration. The on SMS message received method handles the incoming SMS message. The on SMS message sent method is called when the SMS message is sent. This is a sample implementation of the on SMS message sent method. Once the message is sent, the message SMS message sent successfully is displayed. This is a sample implementation of the on SMS message received method. This API handles incoming messages. We can get the text of a message into a string and operate on it. Here, we're going to explain how to search for an SMS in the inbox. Create the SMS message listener object and create an SMS manager instance with the listener as the callback to check the status of the message being sent or received. Search message box N is the method which helps us to search for SMS messages by the keyword in the specified message box. Some points to be noted while using this method is that a search with a specified keyword performs a search using only the first 50 characters of the body text. The SMS messages in the search result contain only 160 bytes for the body text. Now I'm going to explain about receiving push messages. Whenever we need to implement push messaging, we need an instance of push message listener. Then we create an object of the push manager and initialize it. Finally, to register the push messaging service for the current application, we use the register push service method. This method is asynchronous. Here I'm going to describe the push message listener. In this slide, I've declared the push message listener class. I have to implement my version of the iPush manager listener and iPush event listener. The onPush service registered method notifies the result of the push manager, register push service method. The onPush service unregistered method 
notifies the result of the push manager unregister push service method. The on push message received method handles the incoming push message from the server. The Telephony namespace is one of the domain namespaces of the framework. Its main purpose is to help access the Telephony capabilities of the device. It consists of many methods that are responsible for performing different tasks, such as providing access to the call facility, providing network query services, and providing access to the SIM module. Here I'm going to explain the sample code for the call status and the call type. First, I've constructed an object for the call manager. Then, the getCurrentCallStatus method is used to get the call status of the current call. And, the getCurrentCallType is used to get the call type of the current call. This sample code explains how to get the network information. First, we have to construct an object of the network manager and get the status of the network by using Get Network Status APIs. The Is Call Service Available method is used to verify the availability of the call service. The Is Data Service Available method is used to verify the availability of the data service. The is roaming method is used to check whether the current network is in the roaming status or not. Then, the get network info method is used to get the network information. In this example, I'm going to explain how to get the SIM info. First, we created and initialized an object of the named SIM info. Then, the get MNC method can be used to get the MNC, i.e., the mobile network code of the SIM. The getMCC method can be used to get the MCC, i.e., the mobile country code of the SIM. To get the SPN, i.e., the service provider name string of the SIM card, we can use the getSPN method. To get the ICC ID, i.e., the integrated circuit card identification of the SIM card, we can use the get ICC ID method. And finally, to get the operator name of the SIM card, we can use the get operator name method. For communicating, we have the HTTP class to support communicating via the HTTP protocol. Wi-Fi ad hoc mode is useful for communicating with nearby hosts. Wi-Fi Direct is provided to operate in infrastructure mode. To communicate with remote host, we use the socket class. NFC and Wi-Fi Direct have also been included. Telephony has been added to handle call-related operations. Then we have messaging, which is used for sending messages such as SMS, MMS, email, and push messages.